Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hall Simmer channel. This evening, we are going to jump right in and talk about uh, the pre-flight inspection of the Cessna 152. And then we are going to go through the engine startup procedures. And then finally, we're going to discuss shutting the Cessna 152 down, the procedures to go through to do that. So we're going to jump right in to the pre-flight inspection that you would go through in order to make sure everything is okay with the aircraft before you taxi her out to the runway for departure. So the first thing that you will do is you will be on the outside of the aircraft, of course and you will open the door. However, uh, for this particular default aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator, you c it does not simulate the opening of the door. It just does not do that. Uh, depending on who, you can buy a third-party aircraft. I don't know if they have a Cessna 152 that does simulate the door opening. But you will obviously open the door to get into the cockpit. So we will just pretend like the door is open and we will jump right in. And inside the cockpit, you would have more than likely the next step would be you would remove the control lock from the base of the yoke. So there might be a control lock here that is sort of uh, locks the, the yoke in a position. You would remove that uh, lock. We don't have that simulated here, so I am not able to show you that. But what I am going to do is I'm actually going to tempor uh, temporarily remove the yoke here because there are certain things that you need to see that are hidden behind the yoke. So I'm going to select the yoke to remove the yoke temporarily. And then what I'm going to do is zoom in to the, oops, it's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to zoom in to the magneto switch, which is where the key is. This is the correct area. And you'll see on this off right now, the key actually in uh, reality should not even be in here. However, this is a flight simulator, so they just leave the key in. <laughs> I can't take it out. I can't simulate removing the key. So right now it's in off position. And this is for uh, your protection so that when you go outside to do the inspection around the Cessna 152 aircraft, you're not putting yourself in danger, for example, of the prop accidentally going, you know, starting to turn on you. So you have off and you have right, left, both, and start. The reason that you have the right and left here is that you have two magnetos behind the scenes, okay? A magneto is simply a magnet that spins and when it spins, it generates voltage that is used to ignite the spark plug that causes the combustion of fuel. So you might remember in our last stream, we talked about the piston engine. And we talked about intake where air fuel mixture is pulled in. And then it gets compressed up by the piston up towards the spark plug. That spark plug generates a spark, and the magneto is designed to time the uh, the point where basically the ignition of the spark happens, so that you know it fires and it causes a controlled explosion, which then pushes the uh, piston back down and gives power to the engine. So again, the magneto is a spinning magnet that generates voltage that is used to ignite the spark plug that causes the combustion of the fuel in a cylinder. Of course, you have 
four cylinders and a piston engine. Therefore, you have uh, four spark plugs because you have a spark plug for each cylinder. And as a result, the right magneto is going to be attached to two of the four, and the left magneto is going to be attached to the other two. And the reason you have two magnetos is one is a backup to the other in case one of the magnetos fails, you will have the other as a backup. Now, because the engine, because you will only, ha only have two spark plugs that are firing, the engine is going to be less efficient, but the engine is still going to run okay. So it's a backup system, but normally you have both working and all as well. So anyway, that's why we're going to talk about uh, the procedure you go through with magnetos when we, in particular, when we talk about the run-up, which happens after we taxi the aircraft towards the uh, near the area that is close to the. Uh, end of the runway that we are going to depart from. So that is coming in the next stream, but that's I'm jumping ahead of myself, uh, so I don't want to go too far down, other than to give you some background on the magnetos. Uh, the next thing that you want to do is in the, in the next step is to check that all avionics are off. So that's basically we see that they are all indeed off, and that is in this area right here, and also the uh, ADF that's turned off, and uh, basically you're looking to make sure that there's nothing on uh, at the moment. And uh, so we are good, also the transponder's off. So everything is off here in this area. So that is good. Now, what we're going to do next is make sure that the mixture, which is this knob right here, we're going to make sure the mixture is set to idle cutoff, which basically means pulled all the way out. So the mixture, this mixture knob is used to control the air fuel ratio inside of uh, inside of the carburetor, carburetor, excuse me. So bottom line is what's happening is this has to be adjusted. Usually when you're below 3,000 feet, it's in. Uh, as you climb and get, uh, and the air gets thinner and there's less air to supply for the air fuel mixture, you start to lean this out as you get higher and higher in altitude up in the sky. So because as you know, if you've been in the mountains, the air gets thin as you get up uh, higher and higher. If you've ever done any hiking, um, you have less oxygen to deal with. So, anyway, the step is the step in this procedure says make sure the mixture is set to idle cutoff. So we want it all the way out. And then the next thing we're going to do is switch on the battery. Master. So we have the alternator and we have the battery, alternator, battery. And in this case, we're just going to focus on the battery. And we're going to flip that on. And you'll start to see that some things come alive. And you'll start to hear the gyros turn. And so, when you do that, what we want to make sure is that we have enough fuel. And we can only check that when the battery is activated. We see right now we are halfway on uh, the right tank and the left tank and the wings. So the tanks are in the wings, and we see we're halfway full. So ideally, you would want to have full tanks. And so your needle would be all the way over to the right here on both sides. 
we are not, but uh, so we would want to, especially on long trips, add fuel to make sure we have full tanks. And that's what that is about. So we're checking our fuel quantity. And then the next thing we want to do, and I'm going to scroll down on the, the screen I'm looking at to make sure that I can see everything okay. Hold on, you all, just a second. Okay, the next thing we want to check are the lights. Now, in order to check the lights, we actually have to step outside the plane to see them. But what I'm going to do, these, the lights are all here. Navigation, strobe, beacon lights, taxi light, and landing light. So what I want to do is turn each individual one on, one at a time, so that you can see how they uh, correspond to the lights on the aircraft and where they are located. So I'm going to start with the nav lights. And when I go to the exterior of the, uh, go to the outside view of the aircraft and back off just a little bit, you'll see that there's the green navigation light on the, as you face the plane, it's on the left side. And then uh, on the right side, as you face the, the front of the plane, uh, it's on the right side is the red navigation light. And you've seen this when you, if you've looked up, into the sky and you've noticed you see the green and red light on the aircraft those are the navigation lights which tell you if, especially at night if a uh, you're flying around and you see it, the green and red lights with the green on the left and the red on the right it's telling you at night that that aircraft is heading somewhat in your direction because you can see both lights and so just be aware of that and and make sure you avoid that aircraft that might be coming your direction. So that's what the nav light is all about. And then inside we have, so I'm going to turn that off. Also, we have the strobe light. And I flip that on. Let's see what that looks like. Not a lot of <laughs> cars. Uh, anyway. You'll see that it's flashing. It's right behind the nav light on both sides of the wing. So there's a strobe light flashing right there. And, oops, there it is again. It's flashing on this side right here. And again, if you've watched airplanes fly overhead, you've seen strobe lights flashing. Uh, those are pretty easy to pick out. So, that's the strobe light. The beacon light is the next light we're going to discuss. So, I'm going to turn off the strobe light and look at the beacon light. And that is the red light right here. That will be a, I believe it's a turning light. And something like a little mini... Uh, let me zoom in on it so you can see it. You can see it's flashing. That's the beacon, which, again, is used to get the attention of other aircraft and also of people as you're getting ready to start the engine. This is something that you can use to get people's attention so that they are aware to be clear of the aircraft. So I'm going to go back inside turn that off and then we have the taxi light that is handy especially at night when you need to taxi at night on the taxiway and you'll see it's behind the propeller there there's the taxi light I want to go back in and turn that off and finally the landing light I'm going to turn that on that also is the same spot but it is a brighter light that you can see right 
right there. So, again, I'm going to go back into the inside of the aircraft and turn that off. And then the next thing I'm going to do is to extend the flaps 30 degrees. So right here we have the flap lever. I'm going to grab that and we're going to go all the way down to 30. As you can see, it's going down. So on the outside of the aircraft now, we see the flaps are fully extended. So right here, you can see this one, the right flap here and left flap. Uh, so we see that they are fully extended now. We're going to leave it that way for the time being so that because they will be part of the um, pre-flight inspection when we examine the exterior of the aircraft. So I am going to return back inside the cockpit. And any lights that you have turned on, the next step will be to just turn them off. Because, you know, as you know, um, you know, they, they can uh, drain the battery a little bit. But, you know, obviously you don't want to leave the battery on either for a long time. So uh, we got them all turned off, I believe. And at this point, the lights are switched off. Now we are going to, as I just mentioned, switch off the battery because we don't leave, want to leave that on as we are doing our inspection of the aircraft. So I am going to switch that off. And you notice you hear everything begin to wind down, including the, the gyros that control some of the systems up here. So everything is shutting down. Uh, all, all sounds good. And so we're ready to proceed forward with our pre-flight inspection. And one of the reasons you want to have the uh, battery off is because it takes a while to do the inspection. And uh, if you leave it on as you're examining various parts of the aircraft, uh, you might drain your battery. So it's a good idea to shut that off, which is part of the procedure. One of the things that you want to do while you're still within, I'm going to put the yoke back on is you want to make sure that you have full and free movement of all the flying controls. And that's the ailerons, which if, if you remember from last stream, we talked about pitch, roll, yaw. And so we have the ailerons controlling yo, uh, <laughs> roll, sorry. Uh, and those are here. You see they're going up and down as I turn right and left. Uh, then we have the pitch, which is controlled by the uh, elevator control surface. So I'll go back behind the plane, and that's this right here. And then we have the yaw controlled by the rudder. We talked about that in the last uh, stream that, that I did. So uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that those are moving correctly so you will you will like push the yoke forward and do this you know you go through a full range and while you're doing that you're going to be looking at the control surfaces so and also you're going to be by the way you're going to be pressing your pedals below as well because you want to make sure your rudder in the back is working as well so so you're you're doing this and going through the full range of motion all the way forward all the way back fully right fully left like this and while you're doing that you want to make sure you're looking at your controls on both, of course, the ailerons on both sides. So let me do that. Make sure they're functioning properly. And you're going to have to crane your neck a little bit, but behind you, you're also going to be wanting to look at the rudder. 
and then your make sure your elevator is also working properly so you're going to control the uh, you're going to make sure that everything is basically functioning that everything's working okay and also the other interesting thing is there is something that is called the uh, elevator trim and that is this this elevator trim wheel right here and right now the trim you'll notice it's in the takeoff position which is uh, central to nose down or nose up trim okay so we're going to talk about trim more in future streams but right now be aware of the fact that right now it's, it's uh, in the center position so if I were and this is on the right side of the elevator only so if I step outside of the aircraft the trim is this section right here okay right there and if I go down you'll notice it's it's neutral it's neither up nor down now if I go back in to the aircraft and then I start to rotate the trim so that it is nose down and I go back outside if we look at close we see that now the trim is is up like this okay so it's no longer centered in the takeoff position so now I'm going to go the opposite way nose up trim we're going to hit the exterior view and you see now that the trim is all the way down it's a little more evident if back off just a bit you see it's that's eh, it's a little hard to see but it, you can see it's down now right there and not central so we're going to put it back into the takeoff position go back about center and when I do you'll see once again that the trim is centered so that's another um, check that you want to do to make sure everything is working okay and then uh, so we are ready to conduct the visual inspection of the aircraft on the outside now I'm not going to do every last thing because we're using a simulator and I will tell you it takes a while I think I heard one guy say in a video who was going through the inspection that it could take 30 minutes or longer to do a proper inspection of the aircraft so I just want to talk at a high level about some of the things that are done when you're doing a visual inspection so first off they will there will be a logbook that will be inside the aircraft and you can review the logbook to see what kind of maintenance has been done on the plane but one of the one of the things you want to do is check to make sure that the doors of the aircraft latch securely and that they you know that they latch firmly and securely and that nothing's loose you're also going to check to make sure that your windows get this guy right, to make sure your windows are free from any cracks or scratches uh, and that they're you know they're clean so you don't want somebody uh, with a uh, you know like you do on cars where you have wash me because the windows are so filthy <laughs> you can't see outside so you want to make sure those are clean as part of your inspection and then all throughout the aircraft another thing they're gonna do is they're gonna look at the rivets they're gonna run there they're gonna do inspections of the rivets all throughout the aircraft you can see these all over the place as they're walking around including around the engine cowling and all around here and just making sure that nothing looks loose and also another thing they're going to be looking for is that you know from nose to tail 
they're going to be looking for any dents, uh, whether it's on the spinner, the kind of the propeller cone here, uh, any dents or dings or any cracks, any, you know, as they look at the skin of the aircraft the fu from the fuselage, the wings, the tail, all of that. And so it's sort of a visual inspection and a walk around that is done to make sure that everything looks okay. Uh, the other thing they're going to do is they're going to um, look at the gasoline in the tanks. And I don't see it simulated here, but there's a spot usually where they will, um, oops, where they will put a little, uh, kind of looks like a tube that they push up against the wing. And that will force gasoline to come out into the tube. But what they what they want to do is make sure, first of all, that the right uh, gasoline is in the Cessna 152. And the Cessna 152 takes two types of gasoline. It's, one of them is 100 LL, which means low lead. And then, and that one is, I believe it's dyed blue color. So they dye the gasoline to help uh, indicate what kind of aviation gas or avgas that you're looking at. And then there's 100 gasoline, and that is dyed green. So either one of those is acceptable for the Cessna 152. And the reason that's important is the wrong gasoline can cause a, a uh, strong, stronger explosion in the engine as it's going through the compression and detonating. And if it's the wrong gasoline, you won't get the smooth burn or controlled explosion. You'll get an out-of-control sort of explosion that can damage the engine. So you definitely want to make sure that you have the right gasoline uh, in the tanks. The other thing they're going to look for uh, in that tube when they do a sample on both of the wings because you have a tank on this wing and on the, as we face it on the right wing and then a tank over here on the left wing. So they're going to do it in both places and they're going to be looking for any water in the fuel. So sometimes you can get water in the fuel condensation or whatever that occurs uh, and they're going to look for that and they will continue to um, expel fuel by pushing up against the wing there until the, there is no more water in the fuel. Uh, the other thing that I might look for is the tanks are um, encased in a, a rubber type um, seal, as it were, that uh, surrounds the tanks that holds the fuel and sometimes over time that rubber can deteriorate and so they may also look for little specks in the gasoline which would indicate that uh, the rubber might be deteriorating and starting to uh, you know show up in the fuel samples so those are those are some of the things that of course if the tanks are not feel, uh, full and they want them to be full, then they're going to uh, unscrew these caps and add, add fuel to those tanks. Um, the other check that needs to be done is to make sure that these caps are securely fastened, of course, uh, to the wing. So that's also important to do. They're going to also check the engine oil. So they're going to open this up and make sure that there's sufficient oil there and the, that the uh, condition of the oil is good and clear and it's not, uh, you know, that it's been properly, uh, you know, replaced if needed. And so, or maybe more oil is, uh, maybe one needs to add more oil if it's low. So the other thing that uh, will be looked at is the landing gear. So they'll come down and inspect the landing gear, go around 
And one of the things I forgot to mention, as they're walking around the aircraft, they're going to be checking to see if there's anything loose. So they'll look at the flaps very closely, and they'll kind of run their hands through and just make sure that there's nothing loose. They'll be checking connections to make sure that uh, everything looks good, including the elevator as well. They'll be looking at that. And that's true here as well. So they're going to make sure that there's nothing loose with the landing gear. And also that there's nothing leaking as well, like hydraulic fluid. Uh, that the landing gear is free of grease, oil, and just, you know, basically that there's no cracks, corrosion, any kind of rust, anything like that. They're going to look at the tires to make sure that the tires are properly inflated. One thing that could be a, a definite sign of a problem is if you come to the airplane and you notice it's leaning a little bit because uh, maybe you have a flat <laughs> one of the tires and so that could be a sign right there that you have a, an issue um, so they'll look at the tires uh, make sure those are good that there's no excessive wear on the tire uh, they're going to look at the propeller as well and look to see if there's any dings or dents or cracks or anything that might be of concern by the way there will be there may be cracks you know on the aircraft uh some of them are not so much uh, a big concern and some might be so if you go to a flight school they will tell you what specifically to look for i think i remember when i did a discovery flight one time that uh, I saw some cracks, but they uh, said that those were not of concern, that there's only a certain type of cracks that are of concern. But anyway, with that said, same thing with the propeller. We're going to run their hands up and down to make sure that there's uh, no excessive type of uh, pitting or cracks or nicks or things that might uh, have an impact on the propeller functioning properly uh one of the things they're going to look for of course going to do this you know they might even have flashlights they look within the cowling of the engine make sure that things are secure make sure that uh, there's you know again uh no kind of corrosion or anything that's loose uh, make sure that the air filter is uh free from anything like uh bugs or even uh bird's nests if the plane's been sitting there a while and uh, <laughs> some people have found bird's nests there uh, as a bird tries to, as birds try to make their home out of the aircraft. So you never know what you might find. And that's part of the reason why you want to do a, uh, a uh, exterior inspection of the aircraft. Another thing is with the pitot tube, if I zoom in, I don't know how close I could get in, but right here you want to make sure there's no instruction obstruction here and also that there's no obstruction there's a little hole here as well on the side of the aircraft and you basically want to make sure those are not obstructed because your instruments rely on uh, about three of your instruments rely on those two areas and if they're obstructed you will not have uh, the the static line that runs from here um, that is used by some of the instruments is can be a problem if it's obstructed as well so so you look at the pitot tube make sure there's no obstruction here that it's clear no obstruction here on the uh, this static line that runs from here there's a hole for the static reading And so, like I said, the inspection is a lengthy process. It takes a while to do, um, and but it is important to do each before you take the plane out to make sure that everything is okay. So after the inspection has been done, it is now time to go back, at least from an ex exterior. Uh, side of the fence 
and it's time to go back in the plane and do the engine start. So now we're ready to go through the procedure for the engine start. So again, we're going to make sure that the passenger door is closed and locked. Uh, we are going to make sure as a next step that the parking brake is set, which it is. This is parking brake off. This is parking brake on. So we want to make sure that the parking brake is pulled out. We want to make sure that as a next step that all the circuit breakers are pushed in. So we're going to run through here and make sure that none of the breakers are out of their respective slots. And those all look good. So the next step will be to make sure that the on the floor there is a fuel shutoff valve lever and I need to position this so you can see it it's right here and this needs to go to the left to activate it turn it on it's just a it's sort of a extra safety feature that should there be damage for example to a fuel line if a fuel line gets broken it ha it uh, is designed to keep that fuel from seeping over into say a hot engine which you don't want to do and end up with a some kind of a engine fire so it is put there for safety reasons and we want to make sure that is on then the next thing we want to do is prime the engine. So I'm going to remove the yoke so we can see this. But here's the primer. And what this does is it forces a little fuel into the cylinders of the engine. And it usually on a normal day, uh, pretty much normal temperature, you can do this about three times. We're going to do it again. And then one more time. On a cold day, it might require more than that, like let's say five to seven, but we'll say this is just a nice uh, nice day and uh, three should be sufficient. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure the throttle is, which is this right here, the throttle. We're going to make sure that is pushed in about a quarter of an inch, so just a little bit like that not much and then we're going to make sure that the carburetor heat lever is set to off right now it is off it's pushed in so pushed in is off pulled out is on as you see it says anti-ice the engine so what the carburetor heat lever does is it prevents the carburetor from icing up, which can happen when uh, there's low engine power and you might get icing that occurs within the carburetor. So in order to draw hot air into the uh, engine and to melt off the uh, carburetor heat or a carburetor heat, the ice within the carburetor, uh, you'll pull this out and it will begin to melt the ice. And what happens is if you do have ice building up in the carburetor, you'll notice the engine will run rough, and you'll notice there will be less power to the engine. And the reason for that is the carb heat's job in the first place is to handle that. We talked about the mixture. This works with the carburetor to control the air-fuel mixture uh, ratio that is sent uh, over... When you have that intake process of the piston engine, it's drawing in that fuel-air mixture. And it controls how much, what the ratio is of fuel to air. So the carburetor has is a part of that process. And uh, right now, we're going to leave that off. And then the next thing we're going to do is, uh, again, we're going to go back over here to the to the master. And we are going to switch on the battery. So on the right side is the battery master switch. The battery is used to power up the electrical systems, as you can see. 
and here and start the uh, and basically it's used to start the engine and also if the alternator word of malfunction did not work it does provide a bit of uh, reserve power uh, so that uh, you have a backup in case something happens with the alternator What it basically does, what the battery basically does is it converts chemical energy over to electrical energy when you're, so that uh, you have that energy, energy, excuse me, when starting the engine. The alternator, which we're also going to turn on, that is used to provide a steady and reliable source of electrical energy to the electrical components of the aircraft and it also recharges the battery. Now I'm going to turn this off again for just a second. Um, one thing you'll notice uh, if I go over here to the ammeter is if power is coming primarily from the battery you'll notice that the so I get over here a little further you'll notice that the this uh, what am I trying to say line here this white line is over to the left of the zero and and it's indicating that the current is currently pulling from the battery now when we start the engine you'll notice that that will shift to the right because the current will then switch over to the alternator which just because we turn this on you'll notice that it's still to the left because we haven't started the engine yet therefore the alternator is not operating because it's it uh, rotates uh, and becomes active when the engine is started anyway you'll notice the gyros again we talked about that there are certain instruments that are connected to the gyros if you think about like a top spinning top it's like a gyroscopic in fact, you spin the top and it stays horizontal as it's spinning around and it doesn't tip over. And so there are certain, uh, I guess, laws in effect there as that top is spinning. Well, those that keeps the top in place. Well, that's the principle that's used for three of the instruments. And those are the attitude indicator, the heading indicator, and then the turn coordinator all use gyros and that's what you hear when you hear the sound uh, there in the background as I'm talking those are the gyros and then you know you mentioned I mentioned about the on the outside when we were looking at the exterior of the aircraft you saw the pitot tube and, a, and the static port that's what I was the word I was searching for static port or static line you want to keep those free of obstructions because three of the instruments rely on those being clear in order to have accurate readings. So that's the airspeed indicator, the uh, vertical speed indicator, and the altimeter right here. So those run off of those systems. And we'll go into a deeper dive on those uh, on the, the uh, instruments that are in the cockpit later so i don't want to go down that uh track in this particular stream but i do want to mention that and then the next thing you will do is now that the master switches are on for the battery and the alternator the next thing we'll do is insert the key which is already done but in real life you should not insert it until this point so we insert the key. We're going to turn on the beacon because we want to use that again. That's that red line on the tail. So let me back off. Oops. There it is. It's activated. We're going to turn on the beacon because that's a way of getting uh, people's attention, letting them know that we are getting ready to start the engine. Now, as we're getting ready to start the engine, 
We want to look around and make sure that the area is clear. Now, ignore the fact that we have a guy who's oblivious to the fact that we're, I can't get, I don't know how to move him. He's on the outside. This guy right here. We'll just pretend like he's not there. And But you want to look around because you're getting ready to start the engine, which means the propeller is going to be uh, activated. So the next thing we want to do is after making sure the area is clear, is we're going to holler. Well, first thing we want to do is open the window. So you would click this, and this window, you would push the window open. Problem is I can't simulate that because the simulator doesn't, or this, uh, sorry, this particular Cessna 152, it's not simulated for this one. But you would open the window, and you would say something like, clear prop, and you would holler that out. Now, doing that at home is good practice, but it also gets uh, strange looks from your family members who think that you are uh, talking to yourself or wondering what in the world you're doing. But it is actually something that's done to get people's attention again so that they are aware that you are about to start the engine. So the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to turn the key into the start position. When we do that, we see that it is on. Let's go outside just to confirm that. Oops. Let's try it again. I may have missed something, but let's try it again. I don't know if it can. What am I missing? Maybe I don't have the throttle in enough, so let me try that. Oh, you know what? I forgot to set the knob. So there's a step. Let me back up just a bit, minute. I have the knob at fuel cut up basically way out here. And... I forgot to push this into full rich. So this comes at the point right after we checked for the uh, this step right here. Set the fuel fuel shutoff valve to on. It's right after that step we push the mixture in. That's where I, I forgot to do that. Because you want to be full rich. Uh, to make sure that you have uh, that you're not cutting the fuel off from by having it all the way out. So uh, we have it in now. We should be good to go. So let's try it again. We're going to go back to the key. And that was good troubleshooting because there you go. That's much better. Now we're rocking and rolling. So there's our engine startup. And also is a good example of how you can miss a step <laughs> and have to sort of troubleshoot to see what you skipped over to keep the uh, engine from starting. So I missed that one and I apologize for missing that, but you do have to have the mixture pushed in in order to start the engine. Okay, now, after the engine starts, you want to make sure, on the tachometer, you want to make sure that your RPM is basically an idle, which is 1,000 RPM or less. So this is a 1,000 right here. So as long as you're there or under that, you're fine. Uh, at this point, you want to check things like your oil temperature and your oil pressure. So we want to make sure that the indicators are starting to rise. Um, we're starting to see movement on the line here starting to go up indicating that we're getting some you know sufficient oil pressure which eventually you want to make sure you're in the green as we say you're in the green before you take off and uh, this one right here the oil temperature 
on a cold day, it could take a bit of time to show any indication that the uh, that you're getting uh, that the uh, oil is heating up properly uh, in the engine. So you have to give it a bit, but it should start to rise slowly and especially on a cold day it can take some time so you might have to be patient uh, in order to see any indication that uh, all is well. And then the next thing we want to do is to switch on the avionics. Now in this simulator it's switched on automatically. It, it, in the real world you would want to turn off turn off. You would want to turn on your to COM and NAV, uh, NAV for navigation, COM for communication. You would make, want to make sure you turn on your radios. Uh, and you can tell they're on because you see the numbers showing up. The other thing that you want to make sure uh, the ADF is on, that looks good. Uh, so basically, you would turn these on yourself. But uh, the simulator just went ahead and turned them on for us. <laughs> so I can't really demonstrate that other than to say just be aware that that would be a step you would have to take. So we'll move on down the checklist. Now... On a day like that where it's sunny and, and uh, the light, you know, the sky is bright and all, uh, and it's not nighttime, turning on the strobe light is probably okay. I've heard some say that sometimes the strobe light can be blinding. Uh, so what they will do, they will wait and turn the strobe light on uh, right before takeoff so that they're not blinding other pilots out there. Uh, especially if they're close by so just keep that in mind it's as an act of courtesy that while you can turn it on right now it may uh, blind other pilots so it might be best to wait until right before takeoff especially at nighttime uh, when it can't get quite blinding the other time to turn off the strobe is if you're in the clouds because I've heard that when you're in the clouds you can make it difficult to see things because the strobe light is reflecting off of the clouds and it's lighting up everything around you and that can be really annoying so uh, there is some thought to having your strobe light off then but uh, in this example we'll go ahead and leave it on for your navigation lights um, usually between sunset and sunrise is a good time to have those on we'll leave those off for now and then again in the low light situations uh, you might turn on your taxi light before you taxi uh, we're gonna leave it off the next thing that we want to look at is uh, flaps so you might remember we left our flaps down when we were doing the inspection as we were going about the aircraft checking things and this was this is one of the reasons why we had these down is to to check in this area to make sure that everything is okay uh, and just kind of kind of as part of our pre-flight inspection well now we're done with that so we're going to set our flaps back to zero degrees and you can watch them go up so we're back to zero on the flaps and then the next thing we're going to do is set our transponder to standby so that is right here so this area right here all of this is the transponder and Right now, if we set it to standby, which is SBY, standby. That's what you see right there, right above off. What that does is basically the transponder is on, 
but it's not displaying on radar and therefore not showing up uh, where the controllers need to see you in order to identify you and keep track of you along with other traffic that's out there. So we'll just leave it on standby uh, for right now because we're, we haven't taken off yet. And the 1200 is your code. Uh, and you might hear people say squawk a certain code people. You might hear uh, a controller ATC for example, the towers say, you know, squawk, whatever code. They want to give you whatever four number code, and you will set this to that code. But because we are flying VFR, in this case, uh, VFR's standard code is 1200, so you don't have to really do anything because that is the code for VFR. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to need to listen to something called ATIS. Uh, ATIS means Automatic Terminal Information Service. And what it is, it is a broadcast of recorded aeronautical information in busier terminal areas. So busier airports, basically. And you're going to get certain information in the 80s. You're going to get current weather information. What are the active runways being used for takeoff and landing? Uh, any notice to airmen or notums? Uh, any other observations that you need to be aware of, etc. We're going to talk about this more in the next uh, stream. But for now, I just want to show you how to use your radios to get the ATIS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the screen that you're looking at just a bit. Because we're flying from our computer, one way that you could get this information is to go to airdav.com, as you can see here on the screen. And what you could do is, under the, uh, if you go to the top left where you see the tabs, where you see airports, nav aids, airspace fixes, etc. The first tab, airports, you will make sure that that tab is selected so that you see airport information like you do on the, the screen there, the, the uh, first uh, screenshot that I have there where it says airport information and then in that uh, field next to identifier name or city you're going to put the identifier of your particular airport in my case I'm flying from Spirit of St. Louis Airport so the identifier is KSUS or Kilo Sierra Uniform Sierra KSUS so I'm, you can see I've typed that in there and then there's that orange button that says get airport information. When you click on that, you're going to get a lot of information about the particular airport that you're looking at. And so one section of that information is airport communications. So you're going to look for that section. And what you're going to look for is ATIS. And you'll see A-T-I-S and you're going to look at the frequency next to it. In my case, in the case of KSUS or Spirit of St. Louis Airport, it is 134.8. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my radio. On the outer part controls the left side of the decimal. So I'm going to switch that to 134 like that. The right side is controlled by the inner knob, and I don't have to do too much. 134.8, so 800, 134.8. Now, it's in the standby frequency right now, so I'm going to switch that frequency over so that it's in use. Now, listen. Oh, 
Okay. So that's the broadcast, and it starts all over again, over and over and over. What I'm going to do, you see the one here is pressed in? That is corresponding to the first COM unit right up here. And that's so that's that's why it's pressed in and why I'm picking up that one that frequency right here. I'm going to put it on two, which is the second com unit down here. You see, there's com again. That way, we don't have to keep listening to the ATIS. <laughs> we can just sort of temporarily shut it off. Notice if I press one again, it's going to kick off again. See that? So I'm going to go to two just to so I'm pointing down here and I'm not listening to the active frequency here that corresponds to use or use and 134.8 so that's the ATIS and the airnav.com is a great way to get that information if you're at smaller airports or other airports that don't have ATIS uh, it might be uh, you might get uh, they might have what's called AWOS or automated weather observing system that's also automated broadcast of weather conditions. Actually, on the ATIS, uh, let me back up. The ATIS sometimes can have human observations as part of the ATIS. So um, there may be a human element there where the AWOS, uh, which is automated weather observing system, is mostly an automated uh, broadcast. And uh, again, it focuses on weather conditions at the airport and uh, you know, things like barometric pressure, wind speed, the direction of the wind gusts, temperature, dew point, so visibility, sky conditions, yada, yada. And then the, the other option is a SOS, Automated Service Observing System, has some commonality with AWOS, but is a little more complex. Uh, won't go into all the details other than to say, just be aware that both of those, uh, systems uh, instead of ATIS you might have those systems instead and uh, but we have ATIS at this airport and so that's what we are dialed into so now that we have that the other uh, thing we want to do is set our radios to other frequencies for example, the usually the typical order of things uh, at an airport is to set your ATIS and then set your frequency for ground control because the next thing you're going to do is taxi, taxi. And when you taxi, you got to talk to ground to get permission and then taxi to the uh, runway. And then after after they hand, they're going to hand you over to tower. So at a towered airport, you get handed over to tower. And so you can set your frequency for tower. So you have two other frequencies that you're usually setting as well. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that next. And you know what? I had that covered, didn't I? I forgot to switch the... Uh... So you could not see that at all when I was setting the ATIS. So let me do this. I'm going to remove the uh, and I am going to show you how I did that so one more time so when I was setting the ATIS uh, I was the outer knob controls the the side that's to the left of the decimal so there's one three four and then the inner knob controls the right side and that's how I got the, the run three four dot eight and then I, since this is standby and not the, this is the active frequency. Since this is standby, I need to move this frequency over here. And you do that with this, the swap button. So I'm going to flip it. When I do that, you want to make sure that this is set to one because you want to be pointed to the top communication section right here of your avionics. And then number two here is point as uh, pointing to this com down here. So you're allowed up to basically 
I'm going to turn this. I'm going to point this to two so we don't keep hearing ATIS. You have up to four frequencies, bottom line, that you could set. So right now we have ATIS set here. I talked about ground. So what I want to do is show you the two frequencies for uh, ground and tower. So what I want to do next is let's look at ground first. Okay, so we see where it's a spirit ground, and we see the frequency there is 121.7. So now I'm going to remove that. Okay, and I'm going to now in standby, I'm going to switch this to 121. Again, the outer knob controls this area to the left of the dot. And then move this up to seven. Back and forth, you know, right goes higher, left goes lower. One, two, one, dot seven. Now, ATIS is active. If I, well, actually, this frequency is active because I got this pointed to two. But I'm going to swap this frequency over here and now if I have this pointed back up to the comma up here by pressing one now the active frequency would be ground right here okay so swapping here the active frequency is ATIS and then swapping again this is ground and now let's look at the frequency for tower So I'm going to switch the screen again. No wait for it to show up. Okay. So we know for tower it is 124.75. You can see that. 124.75. So let's try to remember that. 124.75. We'll go back and hide that. So 124.75. wait for it to go away all right so what we'll do is down here we'll set this to one two four which already is and then dot seven five so we will go counterclockwise to seven five there we have it one two four dot seven five and if we want to make that the active frequency for com two instead of COM1, uh, we will flip it over to use. But because we have this to one, we're putting up here. So bottom line is, if we wanted to talk to ground, we need to make sure that the mic is set to one, and we're talking to ground. And then when we're ready to talk to tower, since we have that as the active for COM2, we need to press two, and then we can talk to tower when it's time to talk to tower so so that hopefully that gives you an idea of how to set up your frequencies uh, again when you're when you have your engine start up and uh, and you're setting your frequencies after that uh, and uh, getting ready to go ready to depart Finally, uh, we did talk about the transponder to standby. We already did that. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is we're not going to, during this stream, we are not going to taxi. Okay, we're going to do that. We're going to focus on that next stream. But on this stream, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about shutting down. So what happens when you've take it off you've flown either around the airport and you're landing at the same airport or you're flying somewhere else you land and you park and you're ready to shut things down so let's talk about shutting down and the procedure to go through and the steps to go through when you're shutting down your airplane so what I want to do is I'm going to hit escape and I'm going to load shut down flight
and it's going to load up. Okay, now we are ready to go. We're ready to do our shutdown. So what we're doing, we're pretending like we just landed. We've taxied back from the runway, back to a park, to a parking spot where we want to park the plane, uh, go to the outside. One of the things that we want to make sure we've done is uh, as we're coming back from as we're taxing back, basically, we want to make sure that we've, if we've uh, set our flaps for landing, we want to set them back to zero, which we've done already. And again, you can tell by going over here to the right, if I remove the yoke, you will see that the flaps are back to zero at the top here. So we're good there. So I'm going to go back over here and talk about the steps for shutting down. So, you've come to a complete stop. You've, uh, you've uh, applied your brakes to stop, right? And then the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna engage the parking brake. So I'm gonna take the yoke off. The parking brake is right here. So we're gonna pull it out to turn it on. So the parking brake is now on. And then we're going to bring the throttle back to idle if it's not already. So that's all the way back. All right, this is all the way back. We brought it back to idle. And then we're going to bring the mixture knob back to idle. So here's the mixture knob. This is usually enough to at least stop the propeller and, the, and kill the engine. So we're going to pull it all the way back. When we do that, let's watch. And there it has stopped. So that's good, but we still here the, the gyros, for example, we still and we still have our avionics on, right? So there's certain things that we need to address. So we've pulled the mixture back, as you've seen. Now what we're going to do is rotate the magneto selector to off. So let me zoom in here so we can see that all the way to off. And then we're going to switch any lights that we've had on to the off position. So right now we have the landing light on. We're going to turn that off. Taxi lights are off. I'm going to turn beacon light off. Strobe light off. We're going to turn the nav light off. And everything else is off. So all the lights are now off. So we've addressed that. Then we're going to switch off the alternator and battery. So we'll go ahead and turn this off. And we'll go ahead and turn this off as well. And you'll notice now you hear the gyro starting to fade out. You'll see your avionics are off. That looks good. Everything's off there. So we are good to go. So then the next thing you do is you would get your control lock, put it back on the yoke and then you would exit the airplane and you would be done so let's look at the outside and uh, everything looks good and uh, we're done for the day so that is the shutting down process and how that works so I believe on the next stream if I go according to plan unless I change my mind we're going to start talking about we'll focus on the uh taxi of the aircraft and also the what's called the run up and how that works so that will be our next two topics and uh look forward to 
getting with you then to show you how that's done. So this is Hall Simmers signing off.